Hi everyone, it's Cynthia Deeran here. I am super excited to let you know that throughout the month of March, to coincide with International Women's Day, we're launching the Girls Go Global campaign. And we're going to be awarding a full scholarship to the International Business Accelerator to one lucky female entrepreneur. I created the IBA to help micro to medium sized businesses to speed up and de risk the process of taking a company international. And along the way, I've realized that there are not very many women on the international business scene given the number of companies that are out there. And I don't think that's right. So I'm on a mission to change it. What we're going to be doing is awarding one female business owner a full scholarship to the program to give her all the tools she needs to make her business an international success. We'll also follow her journey and let you know how she goes. To celebrate the competition and to help spread the word, I'll be interviewing a very successful female entrepreneur every week throughout the month of March on the Business Beyond Borders podcast. My guests will be sharing their insights about the highs and lows of taking a business international and we'll be talking about the challenges that they faced that their male counterparts didn't have to deal with. We'll also be talking about where they get their inspiration from and their top tips for success. The International Business Accelerator is a digital program, so it and the scholarships are open to anyone anywhere in the world. Although if you are applying for a scholarship, I would suggest that it's probably better if you are a woman. If you're a female founder or you know someone who fits the bill, uh, please visit our website to find out more and put your application in. Just go to internationalbusinessaccelerator.com forward slash girls dash go dash global. Check it out. Stephanie, uh, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Terrific to be on the show. Looking forward to um, meeting yourself. I wanted to start by asking you a really quick question about the multinational anti-avoidance law, which is MAL, which came into effect in Australia just over two years ago. Can you tell us really quickly what it is and can you tell us what you think of it? Yes. The, the multinational tax was introduced um, as a fairer way for multinationals to ensure that they are paying the right tax in the country of origin, which um, as you're aware that there's many multinationals and we deal with them, you see them all the time like Apple and mm. um, Google, LinkedIn and all those players. Uh, what, what the ATO are aiming to do is ensuring that they are not moving their profit somewhere um, like Ireland where it's much lower tax. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a fair tax. Um, I think that all countries, and this is not just Australia, it's all OECD countries are involved, that everyone's going to be involved in, in, in this, these big companies, including Google, and we're already starting to see that. And what do you, what do you think, I mean, what, just tell me a little bit about what you're actually seeing uh, as a result of that law coming into place. Yes, there is more transparency and reporting. And I could give you an example. So, um, it is aiming at the larger end of town. So if there's a multinational with a group revenue of one billion, um, even if the Australian subsidiary is small, they now have to report. Um, in the past, if you're a multinational in Australia and you're a small multinational, you had audit relief and tax could have been minimised. But now that is under the microscope. And what this has actually done is uh, allow further reporting and digging into those entities. Right. I see. Okay. Well, okay. In, yeah. Sorry, they've introduced country by country reporting, which they haven't done that before. Okay, so that's something quite new. Yes, correct. So let, let's get on to, to talk about you because that's really what we're, we're here for today. Uh, you, when we're talking about interviewing you, you have what sounds to me like an Anglo-Saxon name. <laughs> but as we were doing the research for the show, I noticed that you speak both Greek and Serbian. Can you tell me a bit about that? Yes, I can. Um, 
I was born in Australia. Um, my mother and father came on the boat in the uh, early 60s, as the immigrants did. And my mother's background is she's from Greece on the island of Crete. And um, my father was Serbian, which is a, a country in Yugoslavia. So I was born here and I was married to an uh, Englishman. And that's why I have that name there. But my maiden name is Bera, B-E-R-A. Okay. And I suppose I'm divorced now. I should, I should probably go back to it. But the reason I don't is because I'm a director on so many companies, it's a pain in the butt to get all that changed. <laughs> Too much paperwork. <laughs> exactly. And even accountants like myself don't enjoy the paperwork. Absolutely. I was wondering, do you think uh, the fact that you had this this sort of international background from way back in your your history, do you think that uh, that had an effect or, or played any part in the fact that you started a business that turned into a business with international clients? I believe it did. Um, and the reason I did is... I believe, not just myself, any, I believe, and particularly women could do anything they, uh, they desire. Nothing can stop you except imagine, you know, it's just yourself that's stopping you. Yeah. Yes, that had a factor involved. My parents came here with nothing. They wanted a better life for their children, which, you know, that has eventuated. And, of course, we want the same for our children. Yeah. So that is in my blood. That, that is a great place to start. So let's, let's talk about where you kind of got started. You've been in accountancy and business advisory for 24 years. Tell me about yes. the beginning of that journey and how did, you, how did you actually decide that that was the field that you wanted to be in? Well, it's a funny thing. What I desired to be uh, didn't eventuate. And the reason was um, I wanted to do audio engineering. Right. And and my mother, my father died when I was young and I did come, I was brought up in a very strict Greek culture. And my mother thought, well, engineer, uh, audio engineering is not a job for the girls. Okay. And and at that time, there wasn't that many opportunities. And um, it was good that my school had work experience and I joined a company for in that time as work experience. And I thought, no, this is for me. And because I was taking care of the family at the time due to those circumstances, um, I thought it was just a natural progression to get into accountancy. Um, I had my last corporate job was with actually a multinational, a Japanese medical company that set up in Australia. They had a two divisions that came out. I was recruited by Deloitte. I came through there for this role and I really loved it. But what made me, and I know that's one of the questions I may lead to, what made me go into business was back in the early 90s, um, I left because I was working long hours and I needed that flexibility for the family. That certainly wasn't there in the workplace. Mm. And so there was no support then, not just the company, but, you know, childcare situations. So I left. I must say Deloitte's were very supportive at the time and said, oh, what do you want to do? I said, oh, look, I'll be at home for six months, work part-time or something like that. And they actually referred me a few clients and that's how the journey started. So that was really your, your employer helping you to step out on your own? Yes, I think because I was dealing with the SME, I, mm. they were saying that, look, we've got some small clients, we can't deal with them. Would you, we know that you're in that space. Um, would you like to help us? And I did. And that probably allowed me then to start my business. Mm. And the idea, I think you got the question about what's, you know, working for international clients. I felt back then there was certainly a huge opportunity to do so. Yes. More, more than now, do you think? The opportunities were there, yes, because it was a fairly new thing, um, working with multinationals. Back then, it was only the, the big four that were really handling these global clients. But things like Sarbanes-Oxley 
um, Clerp 9. These are things that happened due to independence, started shaking the industry and, and stated that, well, okay, if a, a, an accounting firm or someone's dealing as an audit, they can't do the accounting, you need that independence. And to me, I felt that was a great opportunity and to go into this field and help multinational companies and startups. So tell me, tell me where that transition kind of came from working with SMEs in Australia to working with multinationals. Tell me, is there a bit of a story around that or do you remember the first time that you had a, a multinational international client? Yes. The ones that I, refer, I was referred um, by were offices in Australia, startups from multinationals and Straight away, uh, you got to learn who was um, the stakeholders and who the headquarters were because you had to report to them. Uh, working with multinationals um, and what makes them successful is that they do have good governance and reporting. They have to because someone's consolidating in some headquarters and has to know what's going on globally. Um, today, that's much easier to do, but back then, if you, there was no internet and um, communication was longer, but it was still possible. And so, uh, as time went on, what was that really where the entire business shifted to, you know, to, that, yes. to, to dealing with those massive international clients? It did, and also around that time, it was just the start of the goods and services tax was introduced. That also um, had other opportunities for local companies and including multinationals because they had to also abide by the GST rules, the new GST rules. So mm -hmm. that uh, there was local and international, but I tended to focus more on the international and one because I knew the services they required and how I could help them. And they were certainly my target client and how, how did you actually, how did you go about acquiring these clients? Was this all word of mouth and people just referring you international clients or did you actually have to go out and, and pitch to these clients and travel around to try and get them interested in what you could offer? There was certainly a lot. And, and around that time, the internet was introduced and I said that was the biggest game changer because all of a sudden, I think I must have been one of the first people to join LinkedIn <laughs> because that allowed me then to, to without flying over there, I mean, at that time, uh, I had, uh, Cynthia, I had a young family and I wasn't able to travel as much. Um, my husband at the time was doing a lot of travelling because he was working with a multinational. So I was at home, but that didn't stop me because um, companies like LinkedIn um, and the internet allowed me to reach out so what I did is I, I looked for strategic partners. That was the best mm -hmm. thing. Start and lawyers who were dealing with these multinationals and that started the ball rolling. Also, um, what assisted me was uh, marketing the website and I um, attended the uh, first um, women in business um, courses, one of the first ones, which later years I then became the mentor as well. That was a great journey. And we talked, you know, in that program, they ask you about your ideal client, which was the multinational, and how to reach those people. And that was, you know, a lot of the times it was having those conference calls in different time zones. And I believe that is still the, um, the success of it. Yeah, actually reaching out and targeting people who you want to work with. Yes. And so who, uh, I mean, where, maybe when you started and as you went on, where have most of these clients come from? Do they come from particular countries or particular industries? I mainly targeted the uh, um, uh, English-speaking countries uh, because I was working with um, some Japanese, um, certainly US, UK and Canada, they were the first natural ones I were drawn to, just the fact that they have similar laws and the uh, similar customs. So that was the first step in, in certainly in the 90s and in the first, in 2000, around that time. Um, yeah. And that uh, that was probably, that started to evolve from there. And then I reached out to other countries in Asia Pacific. 
but most of these countries these days speak English, so it is, it is fantastic. Now, I was going to ask you, well, who is your ideal international client? But I think I'm actually going to ask you, tell us about a client that you really <laughs> loved working with. You know, who, have you got a favourite one that you thought was just heaps of fun? Look, I, look, I don't have a particular industry. Um, I tend to be drawn just because I'm interested in technology and technology clients coming out here. Uh, look, I also visited um, the Consumer Electronics Show two or three years ago and what I saw there, and I also met with the US Commercial Service, they helped me identify the sort of clients that were looking to come to Australia and the technology that I saw we don't even recognise that in – we don't even see that in, in Australia as yet. Wow. What, give me an and example. There's so much more to come. Oh, an example would be all the drones <laughs> that were flying yeah. everywhere in this show. <laughs> and because away – this one, you could resonate with this one. Because I was away from my home, I was thinking, oh, who's feeding the cat? Who's watering the pot plants? There was a drone that actually watered the plants. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I thought I want that. My son wasn't going to do it. So, you know, I thought I left all these notes for the kids. But I thought, wouldn't it be easier to get the drone? They're more uh, obedient. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely hilarious. So it's really that, that tech space that gets you excited. It does. And there were so many new things. One of the our clients that we were looking at and they are bringing a product in, I know the health thing is really important, but there was one, there were socks where they had a monitor in the sock that when you were running or walking, it, it um, measured your steps on, a, on the app. Yeah. That was amazing. And I, the question I asked, how many times can you wash these socks? <laughs> Before they wear out. <laughs> Before they wear out. I said oh, about 30 times. So I thought that was interesting, but apps that measure your heartbeat, your blood pressure, and you have all these apps on your phones. How amazing is that? That's an amazing example of wearable, wearable tech, isn't it? And That's wearable it. software. So yes. going, going back to your journey for a moment, you've, you've actually had a couple of companies in this accountancy and business advisory space, right? So can you just walk us through what happened? You were at Deloitte, you left, you started the company, you grew it, you started to work with international clients. Then what happened? I, because we were working with the big four, I mean, and sorry, just with Deloitte's, I, they had a HR um, that I worked through um, and I wasn't really employed by them, but it was more like a recruitment service they had at the time. They mm. don't have it now, which maybe they did that for their clients, which were international. So I had to go through them and a stringent um, HR process to uh, to their client. So, but I was still in touch with them. And back then, um, between say 2000 and 2008, uh, we got a lot of referrals and worked very closely with the big four. And the reason we did, we're in that space, but we were mainly dealing with um, the smaller end of town, the SMEs of those multinationals. Uh, we were working with um, Ernest and Young at the time and they then formed, they actually sold their non-core business and a whole lot of these big four entities did at the time to form a huge um, international outsourcing group, which were part of EY, KPMG and, and those. And because we work with them, they approached me and said, we'd like to buy you out. At the time, I wasn't selling, but I thought it was a good opportunity. So I did. I stayed with them. There was a, a two-year um, stint with them and there's then a non-compete after that. So that was a whole acquisition. I decided because I was passionate about what I did and I still feel that I, I had this market and understood it, I started the process again. Wow. And with nothing. Wow. I, the only thing I had was knowledge I, the internet was better, the cloud computing came into force. I was able to upscale very quickly with all these new um, innovation that was out there. Mm -hmm. And I did. 
and I probably now have triple the clients. And just recently, I have merged with another entity just to give me that scalability. And do you think you, you were able to scale up so quickly because you'd already done it so you really understood what it was that you were doing much better than the first time and then you could just take the technology and really use that as a kind of force multiplier? Yes. Yes, that was it. There was some challenges because when I went back to those, um, when I went back the second time and we did get a lot of referrals from these big four, um, I went back to some of them and they even said, no, sorry, we're not going to refer because we are going to do this now. Oh, right. So, yes. So they told me that matter of fact. So I thought, great. I, I'm glad I've got a lot of contacts. <laughs> so I then had to look outside the square and deal differently where they wouldn't maybe normally would go to find a client. Mm. So I had to, uh, and the scaling up was great. The cloud computing was great. That allowed me, you can work anywhere at any place, including overseas. So that was the game changer. I then went back because we used to work with the consulates and the um, chamber, the International Chamber of Commerce. So I certainly went back to those and tackled those good relations and ever burning your bridges, I think is a big, it was a big assistance for me. Yeah. Uh, look, when people would say, you know, when you tell people I've got an international business, I, I think that there is a perception out there and people often imagine that it's very glamorous. But as you and I know, running an international business can also be pretty tough. And we've just kind of alluded to or touched on some of the challenges you had when you uh, started a new business in the same field. I wonder whether you could either share a bit more around that or or another example of a time when you you found that it was really challenging uh, working in this international space and whether you could just tell us a bit about how you dealt with that difficult time and what you what it taught you Yes, sure look there are certainly challenges in any business um, and I think in some in so in the international, rightly say, you've got to reach those people overseas. You don't know their customs. You don't know really, um, you know, much about them. We're here in Australia. If you're dealing with them, you can certainly quickly get around and find out who you're dealing with. So that's some of the challenges. Um, I think uh, looking outside the square and trying to do something different played a part. And, not, and look, sure, we made mistakes and we thought, okay, was that the best approach? You you will go through that like it, like everyone does. Uh, the challenges were for me that I, I well, and I didn't do, I didn't go back to my old clients. I didn't want to and that wasn't the right ethical thing to do. Mm-hmm. Although some did come back. I had to start from scratch. The challenge back there for me was the GFC. That just happened as I sold and people uh, started um you know, people had less money. Things were very competitive and certainly in the industry I'm in became competitive also due to globalisation Yeah. Um, because you have people saying, well, why would I, you know, deal with an accountant in Sydney where I could go to the Philippines with a fraction of the cost? Sure, uh, you know, service delivery is just partly is just the technical side. There is, they, you know, there's a whole lot of other stuff that goes on, and you know, that is that is obviously an ongoing challenge. Mm-hmm. And so, what do you think your biggest kind of learning was out of that? You know, that challenge of really starting over and having to reach a whole bunch of new people. If there was kind of a takeaway out of that for you, what was it? I th- one was never give up. Um, certainly don't um, put all your eggs in one basket. As I said, I got a lot of referrals by um, the big four, also lawyers and others, but I relied probably early days on those. Hmm. The second time, I didn't have that. So I had to find out, research, how am I going to reach my ideal client mm. that's that's like saying how do i know which company overseas wants to come to australia we don't know that but yes. we can certainly 
We can certainly target strategic partners of those. So they could be lawyers, accountants, consultants, freight forwarders, recruiters, everyone that deals with someone that comes to Australia. Yes. And that's how I had to do So all of a sudden I had different people I had to reach and in different situations, certainly a lot of networking. Um, as you know, you do a lot of networking and, I, and I've learnt and accept that even if you go to so many network functions, you're not going to get your ideal client there. However, in time, people get to know you and they will then refer because they know you've been around and they've seen you again. Mm -hmm. On so, that, do you, think, do you think, I mean, how valuable do you believe networking is? Because as you've pointed out, you know, you don't always get your ideal, you don't rock up at a cocktail party and suddenly your <laughs> ideal client just materialises in front of you. Do you think that it's something that is uh, worth investing time and energy in or do you think that there are faster ways to actually get the clients you're looking for? I think there's, um, I think you have to use different means and we are, we now live in a, you know, more technologically advanced um, situation where we can reach through, you know, like LinkedIn, Facebook and all the social media than before. Um, certainly networking is um, is a process, I would say. And like every process, which we'll probably um, talk about further on about the books I read, is um, it's a process. So it's great to go to these events. I love meeting people personally, but you always have to follow up. Yes. Um, also, uh, researching yourself. Um, I mean, like how I researched you. <laughs> 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 so I thought, wow, she's in the space. She, she's done it. I need to meet her. And we did. And we're still yeah. following up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, look, I think there's then, really something in that. And then I know, wow, you're in a, a fantastic um, space. I want to help you. I like just doing that. But that's karma to me because I know that if I help you, a lot of more people are you. And then... You know, who knows what happens from it? That's all I, I, I'm expecting. I just think well, things will happen. Yeah, look, I think that's that's a really good point. I think that's a really, really uh, positive way to look at it. I wanted to I wanted to talk a bit now about what Penguin actually does. Can you tell us a little bit, bit about how you help your clients and particularly your international clients these days? So I know, for example, one of the things you do is that you have a virtual CFO service. You know, can you just tell us a little bit about what that looks like? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, look, Penguin Management and why we call ourselves Penguin Management is um, uh, the first mice is, yes, if you look, if you see how a penguin is, they're in a colony or they're in a, in a team, they look business-like and that was the reasoning behind the name. But we help companies come here um, to go through all the compliance and, and assist them with that process, but not just, okay, we've done, you know, we've set a company up and we act as their resident director. We, apart from that, we help with their managing their operations and how we do that is they would have salespeople on the ground. We would look after them. We would make sure they have contracts that are Australian compliant. We, we communicate with headquarters. We want this subsidiary here to succeed. Mm -hmm. So we helped we help their office by managing their teams, by ensuring they are compliant. They they have to be. We have to sign some legal documents. We go through with them because they would un, they would not be um, IFA with all the Australian laws. So we do get involved in in a whole lot of array of services, including the accounting, the tax, um, also the HR, the bookkeeping, and the. Um, the company secretarial, which is important. Mm. And do so you the find... CFO, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the CFO service, what, what that means is we will ensure that, okay, they start up here. This was, this would be with any company that starts up. And I think it'd, it'd be the same if you went overseas. You need to know what's the company um, constitution, what's the laws, what's the tax laws, how much do I have to pay? Am I looking after the employees? 
what pension systems there are and healthcare for them. These are the, the primary things that um, these multinationals are looking for. And is there anything that you think multinationals find particularly challenging when they come to Australia to set up or, or you know, is it pretty easy to do uh, in an Australian context? Generally speaking, do, working in Australia or setting up in Australia, it's fairly straightforward. However, companies don't understand um, when we set up, we also set up bank accounts for them and all the regulations that go around that. We help them with that and go through all the um, red tape, you can say, and all the legal jargon. So we make it simple for them. Once we have everything, it is quite a simple process and it doesn't take that long. But knowing that and and uh, communicating that information to them and just ensuring that, you know, we're here, we're going to look after them and they trust us. That's the big component. If you could just imagine you go overseas and you're allowing your CFO or your accountant over there, a person you may not know, be trusted with lots of money, with their staff. I think there's a huge trust element in it. Mm-hmm. It's great to see uh, a woman running a, a really successful business and having done it twice in in an area that's pretty male dominated on the whole. I want to ask you, you know, have you found being a businesswoman uh, in this international and in this fairly uh, kind of hard edge space? Have you found that? Have you found it challenging? Uh, you know, for, from the perspective of being somebody who is female. I could say that although there has been some progress over the years, um, it is challenging, but, you know, uh, I just think that we shouldn't lose sight that we are female and we should, you know, we shouldn't certainly be thinking and acting like a male. I think yeah. a female brings different dynamics to anything, to a business situation. Mm. Um, we are more nurturing despite that's just how we are and I I just think that we shouldn't lose sight of that and um, that our service offering may be different to males and that's a good thing. I, yeah. I don't think it's a challenge. I think that there's so many men out there and as opposed to a female, I'm going to do it differently and this is the reason I'm going to do it. So the networks that I deal with, there is, there is you know, certainly some more, definitely more males, but what I've seen in the last, say, five to ten years there is groups of women um, in, in those organisations. For example, I was last night at the um, Australian Institute of Company Directors. They had a women's group and I attended that network. 20 years ago, they wouldn't have had that. So uh, it is good to see the women out there and I think they should never think there's a barrier. I'm not saying there's no challenges, but I just think that we have to be confident and and anything's reachable if you you go for it. You just set your mind to it. T tell me a little bit about um, raising a family and running a business at the same time, because I'm sure that has been something which has had its had its moments as well. How did you yes. do it? <laughs> well, that was one of the reasonings I got into in business because of the flexibility. Um, when I started the business, I was working not a normal nine to five because I wanted to attend um, schools and uh, participate in the reading for the children. You know, my children now are 24 and 20 and I just remember them as a baby, you know, five years, milestone, 10 years. That was soon yesterday. Time goes so quick. It's very important that you spend that time with yeah. them. And what I did, why I got into the business because of the flexibility um, and I, there was certainly challenges, but I was lucky enough in the area that I was in was international. When the children went to bed, say, for example, after dinner, I was able to get on the phone to Europe and speak to someone in that time, which wasn't a problem for me, or get up earlier before the kids got up and then speak to North America, mm. um, New York. So... In some ways, that helped having those different time zones and having the flexibility. And so you just kind of, uh, you just, you made it work. Look, we made it work because we had family support. There was childcare then. You need to um, have those support networks, otherwise it won't work. 
Yes. You can get a nanny in. It, you know, it's interesting that uh, over in, say, Asian countries or Dubai, they have a lot of helpers. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, we don't have that luxury here, do we? It's, I think it's definitely more difficult than it is in some other places. It is. It is. Now, you've got a strong interest in women in business, which we touched on briefly a little bit uh, a little while ago. Can you just tell me about some of the projects related to this women in business field that you've been involved in? You know, maybe a couple of your favourite ones. Yeah, sure. Um, I think the one that resonated was that I was on a um, Austrade mission to the Middle East and that was led by um, the Premier. She wasn't the Premier at that stage, but, but the Minister, Christina Keneally, because she was female. She had to come along with us. Yes. And we were going to the Middle East, so the challenge, you could imagine the, the women over there were very interested to know about our business and we had to share. Also, in our group, there were mem- women who were to reach out for business in the Middle East and the um, trade mission was about the connections, the meetings and just meeting the people there. Mm. Uh, that was fabulous. One, the culture was so diverse, opposite our culture and understanding how they do business is very important because we do have to bear in mind every, the culture. If we go international, we have to understand the culture and how people act. Um, certainly that was uh, trained for us at the time and you know an example would be if we went to Dubai if you go to Dubai and you um, are meeting with someone there it's always best to have someone else with you if you're in with a man if you're meeting a man I don't know why maybe it's a cultural thing yep. um, and uh, uh, that was something different that we were taught and, and, and experienced. Um, the women there, they were quite bold who were, wanted to come to Australia and expand their um, service offering and, and what they, they learnt a lot about us, how we deal with business here. So to me, just that cultural understanding was very um, viable and very uh, interested, interesting for me because I think we do have to deal with countries, particularly the non-speaking English countries, uh, which have different cultures. Yeah. Now, I, I do remember uh, there was one of these ladies uh, that, and, I, and she did succeed, so I would like to share this, that she had a kitchen in um, the Blue Mountains, near the Blue Mountains, and she was making um, lavash. Do you remember that? The, those biscuits, the lavash biscuits. She had yes. a kitchen she was making those. And it was interesting because how she made them, she obviously thought about um, the culture here, the multicultural here, you know, the olives and all the foods that would go with that type of biscuit. What she did is she introduced it to a few firms up there and I'm glad to say that on the Emirates flights, her biscuits are now on every, on every Emirates. So what a great achievement that would have been. That's a great achievement. Well, that's Including really the and Coles here. So this is a lady that was able to do that from her home and then, of course, she's expanded into her own mm-hmm. factory. And I like that story because I think that a lot of people and especially a lot of, uh, a lot of women who are running businesses, maybe in their spare room or maybe on the kitchen table, think, oh, well, you know, I've got this business and it generates me some money, but uh, I, I couldn't expand my business internationally. That's way too difficult. That's not something that I can achieve. But, you know, your own story and the example that you've just shared of the, the biscuit company demonstrates that if you actually want to, you can achieve it if you've got enough determination and the right tools to do it. You're absolutely right there. And look, I started work from home and, you know, there is so many different platforms, there's so many different opportunities. If you need to meet someone in the city, you can use the virtual offices. That's available now that, that wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Um, I always think that 
uh, even through your website and your marketing, think big, think that you are these global companies because it's only a perception and how you deal with it. That's all yeah. it is. Uh, there is a uh, Glenn Carlson, who is somebody that I've worked with in the past who, who mentors and teaches small business. Glenn is very fond of saying perception is reality. And I think there's a lot yes. of truth in that. So if somebody thinks that you are big and reputable, they're going to treat you as though you are. And if they believe that you're small and disreputable, they're also going to treat you that way. So it's really important that as much as you can, you make people believe that you're big and reputable. Exactly. And that is true. Let's, let's move on to books. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, whether there are any books that have profoundly influenced you. And if you could tell us, maybe, I don't know if you've got several, maybe you have a whole list. Uh, some people don't want to recommend any book. Some people uh, have heaps of books that they want to talk about. But I wondered whether there are a couple of books that have really had an impact on your life. And you could tell me what they are. And then we could just talk about each of those and, and why you've chosen them. It's terrific. Um, look, uh, one book that is still in my mind is by Richard Branson. I, I do follow him. Um, losing My Virginity, I thought that was a great journey of where he started and where he began. He's a, he's a visionary. Mm. Um, certainly the whole journey and, you know, making it till you fake it, he certainly went through all that. <laughs> I thought it was a great book. Um, the other one is, these are all different books, by the way, but the other one is um, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. Mm -hmm. The reason that when you do start a business, it does, uh, when you read that book, it will go through how do you succeed when you do start small and what it means in the process to go to, a, to start expanding because you do need to have those processes in place. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do them, but you have to identify that you will need staff, you will need systems. The book goes through that, and I, I think um, it, it's a very good book for, for people who are looking to start business and expand business. Okay, so The E-Myth by Michael Gerber and... Losing My Virginity by Richard Branson, which he's now followed up with a couple more. I believe the latest one is called Finding My Virginity, although I have to confess I haven't read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The other book, it's probably more of recent times I've read, is um, The Lean Startup by mm -hmm. Eric Holmes. Uh, that, I, I, that is a great book and it's all these uh, new technology. It's based on a lot of these new technology companies that do start up and are don't have much resources in way of money and, and people and how they quickly um, evolve, how you, you know, it's okay to make mistakes and how to, uh, it teaches you the different ways to identify if you have got a good product or service. Mm. I think that's quite a good book. In these times, um, I, I regularly read that one. Okay, we'll so go those over. are... Those are three yes. great, great recommendations. So how, how can people get in touch with you if they would like to connect with you and, and use Penguin Services or find out more about how they connect, can connect in with you around the women in business stuff? Where, where should they go to look for you? Uh, I think through my email or LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, happy for you to share those details. Do you want to just share it here on the recording so that people can can uh, go yes. online straight away and look, and look for you if they'd like to? Yes. So my I'll I'll, I'll just ask my um, email is Stephanie spelt with an F. So it's S T E F A N I E at Penguin Accounts P E N G U I N. Sorry, B P E N G U I N A C C O U N T S mm -hmm. dot com dot au. I hope you got that because I, I think we just paused for a moment. That's all right. We'll we'll put it into the into the show notes so that uh, if people want to, they can actually download the show notes and they can find it there as well. Sure. And I've got um, look. I have got a um, a bit of a guide. If there's anyone interested coming to Australia or wanting to set up, I do have a guide that um, give, provides all that information. I'm happy to share that. Yeah, look, we'll, we'll get a link to that and we can put that into the show notes as well and uh, people can click on the link and get hold of the guide. 
terrific. So, Stephanie, one of the reasons that I was really keen to have you on the show this month is that, as you know, we're currently running the Girls Going Global campaign to to inspire, encourage and empower more women to take their companies international. I was wondering whether you had any final thoughts for the female entrepreneurs who are listening to this program and who are thinking about actually going out there and taking on the world. I think they should go for it. Um, First have that dream and dreams can be possible of course understanding where where that market is and who that market is and then identifying who are the players in that I mean by all means they should be talking to Austrade and there's so many other organizations as well that they can tap into you know just mainly to get information Mm. LinkedIn is quite good if you want to reach out to um, some strategic partners. I think the social media is great. And um, also Chamber of Commerces. Mm. Um, if you're in a particular field, I think it's great for them to, to um, reach out or attend some of those um, Chamber of Commerces. There's a lot of valuable information and, and a lot of connection in those organisations. Mm. Stephanie, it has been great to have you on the show. Uh, It's been great to hear about the books that have inspired you and the journey that you've come on. Um, Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. And all I could just share is, look, go with your dreams and everything's possible. Hey, everyone. If you're enjoying the Business Beyond Borders podcast and you're thinking about expanding your company internationally, you might want to check out the International Business Accelerator, which is something I created to help micro to medium-sized businesses to speed up and de-risk the process of internationalization. The International Business Accelerator, or as we like to call it, the IBA, is a program built on the three principles of skills and knowledge, mentoring and accountability, and community. I built it especially for founders and CEOs who want to take their business to the next level and are wondering where to start. The program is structured in a way that's simple to follow. It's digital, so you can take part from anywhere in the world. It's a lot of fun, and our members love it. So if that's you, if you're thinking about going global, check it out at internationalbusinessaccelerator.com.